So I think uh, have we got a designated person that's going first. Is it Jane it's Needham myself, is the lead? Yeah. I'll pass over to Jane um, and I'll ask Chloe to start the recording. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Beth. And um, good evening, everybody. My name's Jane Needham. I'm the Director for um, Strategy at Derbyshire Community Health Services. So that's a community health provider. I'm also a consultant in public health by background. And I'm really pleased to say I've got a couple of colleagues from different organisations joining me to try and help answer any questions that my, anyone might have as we go through. So I've got Tom, who's joining, joining from Derbyshire County Council. And I've got Rob, who's joining from Derby City Council. I've also got Rebecca on the call. Um, Rebecca Symes on the call, who works alongside me and is going to be keeping her eye on the chat and answering any questions as you pop up into the chat. So hopefully lots of opportunity for people to join in. So I'm just going to share the slides that we've prepared. Um, and Beth, if you can just give me a signal to let me know that they've shared up. OK, that'd be great. Yeah, that's all. For you, Brilliant. Jane. OK. Thanks very much. So what we've got here is, as Beth's already talked about, is there are three elements to the integrated care strategy. Um, this is the strategy document. It's um, It sets out how the local authority, NHS and um, voluntary sector organisations are going to work together in an integrated manner to improve um, the health outcomes for our local populations of Derby and Derbyshire. Um, so that's the document that we are um, really focusing on today. And there are these three key areas of focus. Um, one is around start well, looking at the at younger children, early school readiness. Our focus today is on this stay well, which is um, we'll go into a lot more detail around. And then the third key area of focus is um, on aging well and dying well, which is gonna be covered in another session, I think later on this week, certainly coming up. So included in the presentation here where we're focusing on um, stay well, we're going to I want to talk you through a couple of definitions. So we've absolutely tried to frame this um, presentation so that it is um, anyone who's got no understanding of this. We're, we're coming at it from that angle so that we can really help people begin to understand what is it that we're wanting to achieve and how do we need that um, kind of collaboration with our local communities to make sure that we have the greatest impact possible with this particular key area focus. So I kind of make no apologies for some of the simplicity of the language that we'll use. Um, but certainly if anyone's got any more detailed questions, we'll also want to be going into that. And I know Tom, Rob and Rebecca will help me out with that. So we're going to be looking at the some definitions to, to familiarise people with some of the concepts that we're going to be talking about. The stay well key area of focus, go into a little bit more detail around what that is and particularly why we are focusing on this. So giving a rationale and some evidence as to why this area of focus is important and what if we are looking into the future, we really want to hope to achieve um, and to just test that with yourselves on the call to make sure that our thoughts are aligning with what you as local representatives working in organisations and local living in our local communities um, whether what we're um, anticipating we would want to achieve is resonating with yourselves how we can go about doing that but really importantly to emphasize we're not we're not from a standing start here so to give a couple of examples of what we've already got into place but to explore through discussion with yourselves of if we have these services in place and actually we've still got issues around um disease within our populations what is it that we're not quite getting right that we need to adapt in order to make sure that we that we are really helping people to stay healthy as long as possible so that's what I'm intending to cover. And um, what we've got here is this real quick explainer of some of the terminology that we use far too frequently without maybe giving that explanation as to what it means. So hopefully this just gets everyone onto the same page. So I'll be talking about life expectancy as I go through the presentation. And what that means is very simply the average number of years that a person lives. And life expectancy will vary by geography across Derby and Derbyshire, across the United Kingdom. Um, and that is one of the issues of inequalities that we'll be touching upon. So life expectancy is just how long can you expect to live for? Healthy life expectancy is how long you can expect to live for in good health, so free from disease or injury. And that also varies by geographical area. So we don't want to just have an emphasis on living as long as possible. We want to live in good health for as long as possible. And an early death is someone who passes away at an age that is younger than the life expectancy for the area. So um, within Derby and Derbyshire, then it's, if someone dies younger than what we would anticipate to be the average age, then that would be start to, to be classed as was that a preventable death? Was there something that could have been done um, to prevent that person dying younger than we would expect them to for the life expectancy of our area? 
a term which I'm particularly passionate about, and I know a lot of people on the call will be interested on, is health inequalities. And uh, COVID has brought this terminology into much more frequent use. And what that means is, so if, if there's only two words that we can all remember from today, it's unfair and avoidable. So health inequalities are unfair and unavoidable differences in health between different groups. So that might be health inequalities between a geographical area. It might be health inequalities between certain population groups, certain age groups, um, certain characteristics that we have. That means that one person's experience of ill health is much more severe or occurs more earlier than it does in another population group. So health inequalities are unfair and avoidable differences in health. Risk behaviours and risk factors. So those last two terms that I just want to cover here, risk behaviours are habits or actions that a lot of people in common language will generally recognise as things that cause us to be un unwell, cause us to be more likely to become um, ill. And they're things like smoking, alcohol consumption, other um, kind of risk behaviours tend to be lack of physical activity or um, poor diet. So those are really common things that I'm fairly confident most people on the call would be aware of. Risk factors is when that risk behaviour then goes on to, to cause a condition that increases the likelihood of, of, of ill health. And something to really consider on the call here is that risk behaviours, we call them the, the cause. What we really want to explore under this particular stay well agenda is the cause of the cause. So we know that smoking causes someone to have an increased likelihood of cardiovascular disease or so of a heart condition or of a cancer. But what causes someone to smoke in the first place is something that, that in particular this area of focus in the integrated care strategy is really um, interested in. So the stay well, so this is the point around, so what, what words are we using to describe what does it mean for stay well and where are we going to put all of our energy to try and improve the health of the local Derbyshire population, Derby and Derbyshire population? So the, the wordy um, the wordy definition is to improve, our intention is to improve prevention and early intervention of the three main clinical causes of ill health and early death in our local population. So we know that three diseases cause the greatest burden of ill health and early death for Derbyshire and Derby City people. And that's circulatory disease. So examples of that are high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke respiratory disease um, and examples of that are um, asthma or COPD, so chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or cancers and, you know, the different types of cancers. So what we want to do and to stay well is to acknowledge that these are the things that are causing us to die early and causing us to spend the greater period of time in ill health. There are inequalities that result from this where some people are more likely to experience these diseases than others. And if we can prevent them, so just stop them from happening in the first place or identify them as early as possible. So implement systems that mean we really help people to know as soon as they are at risk of cancer or are at risk of circulatory disease or have just got that diagnosis that it's as early as, po as possible in their disease so that there is the greatest chance of um, treating it and having a good outcome. So that's the stay well area focus. And uh, I've probably touched on this a bit already. So in Derby and Derbyshire, the three main causes of these three diseases and together they cause two out of three of all the early deaths in Derby and Derbyshire. So many of these diseases can be prevented if we understand better the risk behaviours that lead to um, people getting the diseases in the first place and the circumstances that cause people to have these risk behaviours. So that cause people to smoke, to eat unhealthily, to um um, not exercise as, as much as possible, as much as they should do, um, and um, unsafe drinking um, habits, then those are some of the risk behaviours that will lead people to have these um, diseases early. Those risk behaviours are more likely to happen if you've got certain characteristics or live in certain geographical areas. And what we want to do is to really understand the circumstances that lead people to have these risk behaviours so that we can prevent these diseases as early as possible. So two out of three of all the early deaths are due to these diseases, which is why we want to focus on those areas. So the difference in how long someone is expected to live between our most deprived, so that means our poorest areas and our least deprived, so our wealthier areas, there is a gap in life expectancy, which is right here and now in Derby and Derbyshire, which is nine years for men and eight years for women. So trying to turn that into um, a reality for what that might mean 
is I'm not going to be precise about my areas here, but in the most deprived part of Derby City, which is where we know we have the most um, deprived areas, the poorest areas, someone is likely to die nine years earlier if they, if they are male or eight years earlier if they are female than someone who lives in our more wealthy areas, our wealthiest areas of Derby, Derbyshire. And something that was said to me many, many years ago is that basically means that those that someone will get the chance to see their grandchild grow up and someone won't, simply based on the geographical area and the and the level of deprivation in that area. So what we know in terms of those inequalities is that cancer, respiratory and circulatory conditions, so those three illnesses that, that I spoke about early, cause more than half of the difference in those life expectancies. So two out of three deaths and account for half of the difference in that inequality of life expectancy. So again, just kind of framing as to why, why are we going after preventing these diseases in our populations? Hopefully it's because you can see that's where the greatest burden of ill health is coming from. So what do we mean by prevention? So this is, again, is a term that's used really, really frequently and actually quite interchangeably. So I'm not going to go into um, real detail around this, but pure prevention means, and we call that primary prevention, means keeping stopping people from getting the disease in the first place. So prevention is about helping people stay healthy, happy and as independent for as long as possible. And one of the one of the analogies that is really helpful to think about is a stream. So we want to put into place upstream interventions. So we want to stop someone from falling in the stream in the first place, i.e. getting the disease, rather than hoiking them out from the river as they've been coughing, spluttering um, their way along through experiencing the disease. And then we put treatment into place so that the, the interventions we want to put into place are as upstream as possible to stop people falling in the river and um, we don't we want to, and at the moment what the evidence is suggesting is we spend a lot of time and a lot of money from acknowledging people falling in the river and then lifting them out as they are very wet and, and at risk of drowning so we want to put into place these upstream interventions and that is predominantly what this stay well area focus is about so what will it look like? So let's imagine it's five, ten years down the line and we have all really lent into this cause of stay well. We've connected really closely with communities because this is not something that statutory agencies can achieve in isolation. We have got to connect with our communities. We've got to look to communities to support um, to, to be able to support themselves, but also for us to really understand how can we deliver services in a manner that means those people who most need help are most likely to receive it. So what will it look like in five or 10 years time? We'll know we've made a progress if we've extended the life expectancy and healthy life expectancy for all in Derby and Derbyshire. And there are regular statistics that are available for us to be able to reference against to see what's happening. And for those of people who might be interested, so historically, what we've found is that since the sort of 1920s, 30s, is that improvement in life expectancy has been gradual and increasing. Um, but actually, since the sort of the end of um, the last period where we had the austerity measures and particularly during COVID, that healthy life expectancy has stalled and is actually in some geographical areas starting to have a downturn. So you can expect to live a, um, slightly less if you were born now than if you were born probably about 10, 15 years ago because of the period of austerity and because of some of the impact of COVID. So it's really interesting. There's been a very, very long, steady uphill increase. And just recently it's it's begun to stall, level off or in some geographical areas to decline. So we want to make sure that we are extending life expectancy and in particular extending healthy life expectancy. So that means we want to reduce the gap between our most af between our most deprived and our least deprived areas. So our poorest and our wealthiest areas. Um, to make sure that, that we are really having the impact where we need it the most. So how are we going to go about doing that? And um, I'm presenting this as if we're starting from scratch and we absolutely are not. I know there'll be loads of people on this call who are already spend all of their time really focusing on this area. So what we want to do is to stop it being piecemeal and to make sure we systematically all put our, um, put our efforts into this cause. So we want to make sure that we can identify really clearly what makes it more likely that people will develop cancer, circulatory and respiratory disease. And there is a wealth of evidence about that out, out in the um out in the community and out in, in national evidence. So we, we understand that. We know what it is that will make people more likely to develop these diseases. We then want to identify the actions to make sure we are really clear, well, what will reduce the likelihood of um, 
those people getting those diseases, what are the things we can do? And then really listen to communities to help shape those actions. So we know, and I'll be able to come on in a couple of slides, we've got things in place already and they're doing brilliant work. And we still have a problem within Derby and Derbyshire of um, the prevalence of cancer, circulatory and respiratory disease. So we're not quite getting something right. And we want to really learn from communities to understand how can we improve access and how can we improve outcomes for those people who really need our help. So listen to local communities and then work together to deliver these actions. So it looks very simple on one slide. It's really, really complex because of um, all of the factors that we've got to consider behind that. So just coming towards the end of the slides to, to sort of help shape people, it, help shape people's thinking for some of the conversation. So an example of prevention and early intervention, if we consider it for smoking. So the risk behaviour is smoking and the risk factors that smoking will cause are high blood pressure and exposure to carcinogens, which will lead to circulatory disease and cancer. And the evidence for that is I, I doubt very much I'm telling anything anybody doesn't already know. So. These are examples of how do we backtrack from smoking to make sure that we are creating the circumstances where it is a more difficult choice to smoke. And in terms of where the where more people are more likely to be smoking in our in our poorest areas or from certain characteristics, how do we support those communities to be able to take positive action to reduce smoking? If we then think about poor diet, so we know that poor diet can lead to high levels of blood sugars in our blood. So high fasting blood sugar, which again goes on to um, be a risk factor for circulatory illness and for cancers. And so what we want to do is to understand what are the circumstances that lead to poor diet in our communities and what can we do in order to ensure that those are minimised. So what have we got in place already? And I know I've got um, I've got Rob and I've got Tom on the call who will be able to give more information if people want that. But for example, at a national level and in Derby and Derbyshire, we implement this. There are um, NHS health checks. So these are free health checks for people 40 to 74 who are not already are um, being monitored through their GPs for other reasons. So it's a free checkup of, of overall health. And it is really looking to pick out early diagnosis of um, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, stroke, dementia. So people are invited into their GPs to have a health check. And the evidence for this, the health checks have been going for, oh gosh, over 10, possibly even up to 15 years now. So the evidence base around the effectiveness of that early identification of people who otherwise would not routinely be going into their GPs is getting stronger and stronger and stronger in terms of an effective intervention. Um, in terms of wellbeing services, what, what we have within Derby and within Derbyshire, what we've tried to do here is to just summarise. So there are wellbeing services which are operated through our local authorities and they are looking at um, services to support people to stop smoking, to support people to lose and maintain a healthy weight and to become more physically active. And a really quick statistic is if you are someone who wants to quit smoking, you are four times, the evidence indicates you're four times more likely to have a successful quit if you go through one of these recognised approved services than if you try to quit yourself. So there is a really strong evidence base around the support that you receive in these type of services, which means you are more likely to be more successful in your goal, in achieving your goal. Um, and Rob and Tom are um, sitting in the organisations that, that deliver those services for us in Derbyshire and Derby City. So what is it that we can do to make sure that as many people as possible can access them and are in a frame of mind to benefit from those interventions? They also cover lots of other issues as well. So when I talked about that cause of the cause earlier, the evidence would suggest that or housing or lack of access to income, so poor income, um, alcohol misuse, etc. These are all factors that lead you to have um, unhealthier lifestyle habits. So these services as well also have access to income maximisation, so into citizens advice, into housing um, advice and support. So they not only deal with um, those very recognised behaviours of smoking, physical activity, um, um, maintaining healthy weight, but they also really support people around other issues that just might be that might mean right at the moment I just don't feel in a frame of mind to give up smoking because I've got so much stress going on outside of my life um, that actually smoking is a way of me dealing with this at, right at this moment. So why do you views matter? So um, we know the main causes of ill health and early death, and hopefully that those few slides talking about the two and three deaths and the 50 percent in terms of the contribution to health and equalities evidences, why we understand these three, three conditions are things we really want to tackle. 
We also know when the evidence is unequivocal, unequivocal that it's better to prevent an illness in the first place than to treat it once it's occurred. We know what services we've currently got available in Derby and Derbyshire, and we just know really honestly that we need to do more to prevent these conditions. So we, we understand what causes them. We understand what interventions are successful. We know what interventions we've got in place in Derby and Derbyshire, and we're still not cracking it and really delivering for our population. And that's what we want to work with communities on. So your views, I'll take this slide down and maybe put those questions into the chat. Your views really matter here. And what I was just wanting to get into a conversation about is what matters to the people on the, on the call in terms of those three clinical areas, those three clinical conditions we've touched on, what you feel is working well already, what you feel are gaps, and what actions would you like to see from um, the local authorities and from your local NHS and your local voluntary sector in order to support communities to be able to prevent these diseases amongst the local populations. So just while I take that down, I'm just going to pause and just see if Rebecca, Rob or Tom want to just add anything to what I've said there, because I'm very aware that I was speaking on behalf of everyone. So I'm just going to pause. You might not want to. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if there's anything you just wanted to add to anything I've said there before we get into the discussion, that would be great. Yeah, I'll just I'll come in, um, Jane. I think you've um, you know mentioned a really good point around um, we do a lot of lifestyle services to help people, um, but often that's they've already they already ha have excess weight, they've got additional weight, or they are already smoking. So um, we're, also, we're we're not actually preventing it; it's still part of a treatment. So again, just thinking about those gaps is some of those services people already have that condition. Um, and I think also just to pick up on around the um, the finance. So obviously this winter has been incredibly difficult for lots of people. So um, I know um, in Derbyshire and I know in Derby, a huge amount of work's gone on to support people in our services because um, uh, money has become a really strong public health issue. So just want to acknowledge that, that um, we're aware that people coming to our services are needing more help. Than, than just the health, that they often need that economic help, that money help. Thanks, Tom. So I'm just I'm just um, probably looking across to yourself, Beth. So in terms of sort of just generating that conversation, what I'd really love to hear from people is in terms of our rationale as to why we've why um, the system's chosen those three areas of focus, how comfortable and uncomfortable does that feel to people? And in terms of really challenging ourselves, um, you know, on, on the call is we we know what causes ill health. We know the risk behaviours. We know what services we've got into place. We also know there are real inequalities which continue in terms of our ability to reach into those communities who most need our help. So just your thoughts or kind of generation of ideas on this call will really help to inform our next steps around um, wouldn't it be brilliant if in five years time we started to see a reduction in the number of people who are smoking, wouldn't it be fantastic if in you know 10 years time we started to see that uptick once again in terms of life expectancy and we started to see it most strongly in our most deprived communities or amongst our population groups who are uh, who we know are most at risk of ill health. That's that's what we want to really try and get out of this conversation here. Yeah, thanks, Jane. So can we well open it up to the, the room? So if you would like to ask a question, please either raise your hand or you could put it in the, the chat box and my colleague Chloe will keep an eye on the chat box and bring any questions forward as well. Trevor, would you like to ask your question? Hi, yeah. Um, Trevor Parkinson, I'm a chaplain at World Derby Hospital. Um, do a lot of work with um, people at different stages of their health. Um, I think there's an expectation that as you um, uh, become older, say 60, 65, there's an expectation that you will um, have um, different health needs uh, to when you were younger. And I think it's important to understand that and to engage with, in the first case, your primary care provider, your GP, and to any further health treatment, but be a part of that treatment. Um, um, it is not something which is done to you. It is something which you participate in and which you're engaged in. And the more you engage with it, um, the, the, the greater the benefit. 
Thanks, Trevor. Yeah. Um, so if I can just can yeah, just share my thoughts on that. So com totally agree in terms of um, being done to or done with is probably the language that I would would utilize. And and that's the evidence around um, people services operating in a manner which supports people to engage themselves and really take ownership of their own <coughs> health and and improve their health within what what is what is it that they want to ma what matters to them and um, there is really strong evidence that actually people experience greater care people have a better outcome and being really being really honest actually services the cost to the local service population is not as high because we can over intervene we can choose as um, you know as providers to over intervene and actually do more than an individual wants so that ability for us as statutory organizations to sit back and really hear what matters to the to the person and how they want to engage with us is really empowering and actually the evidence is really strong that's the right thing to do so um good good point you're making trevor thanks yeah, um, I have, uh, I'm 76 and I have multiple health conditions, but because of the way I engage with um, different health uh, providers, um, I regard myself as being in good health. I mean, I, I don't, um, um, yeah, it, it's something which is a problem part of my daily life. Anyway, let me let somebody else speak. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Trevor. I'll bring in Richard. I return to the smoking issue. The, the, the ball actually rests with the smoker, not with the people who want the smoker not to be a smoker. For instance, if a smoker, a known smoker, goes to his GP with um, any complaint you want, the GP will only deal with that, that issue. He has eight minutes in which to deal with it. He might know that the smoker, uh, the patient is a smoker. It's highly unlikely that he'll say to him, oh, by the way, do you know that we, health service, can help you to give up smoking? Because this guy doesn't want to give up smoking. <laughs> Believe you me, I smoked for 40 years. It's not an easy matter. To, to walk away from it, and the ball is in my court. Uh, there's tons of information, but if you don't want to give up this habit, you see, it takes your life over. It really consumes your, your very being all the time. Uh, yes, you go down this pathway, sooner or later you become so ill, that you think, oh, wait a minute, I think I better do something about this. And then you do find all sorts of things that are available to you. Employers, for instance, very reluctant to enforce no smoking rules. They, they, they know smoking goes on in hospitals. I've, I've traced smokers standing outside Leicester Infirmary throwing cigarette ends in people's gardens. Well, the hospital know that happens, but, well, it's awkward. Who's going to tell them not to? They're OK, not thanks, Richard. The, what, you know. Yeah, we'll just bring in Jane at that moment. Thank you. So, Richard, so, so if I'm challenging within ourselves, so I completely agree with everything that you're talking about, what the evidence indicates is it's that cause of the cause. So what is it? What is it that's caused someone to smoke in the first place? And that's playing to the point Tom was making around how do we intervene as early as possible so that smoking is not normal within a local, you know, with, within that person's sphere of their life. So what is that? Who are their role models? And, and, and is smoking normalised in that environment? And then if smoking is in place, what is it that what is it that is the cause of the cause? Because we know that we need to address. Is it an income issue? Is it um are there other factors in that person's life that mean right at this particular point in time, the emphasis on quitting smoking is is just not there? So how do we support that behaviour change? And I think that's the point that um, that the services that Rob and Tom are involved in, 
those conversations are fantastic to have. But as Tom points out, they are at a point where the person has actually made that decision to step in to go, right, I am ready to change. What we're trying to do is to step it even more back and say, OK, what are the circumstances and the environment that we need to create so that smoking is not seen as that as that norm? And that's the really important point that we want to pull out. So thanks, Richard. I can see, um, is it Peter's got his hand up? Hi, Peter. Yes, thanks, Jane. Good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, this whole subject is uh, is something that I feel really quite passionate and strongly about, to be honest, in terms of prevention is better than cure. Um, and for me, I, I think the emphasis needs to be on how we communicate with all the various communities that we need to communicate with, um, because it, the communication and the messages that we give can't possibly be one size fits all. And this next comment isn't particularly aimed at Derbyshire and Derby. And Derby. It, it's a general comment, really, that quite often I get a feeling that that is uh, what is offered, particularly at a national level, that we, there, is, there aren't enough nuances in really trying to make sure that we tailor the communications so that we get to the nub of the people who we really want to actually try and influence. So um, my question really is, how much um, flexibility do we have within uh, our ICS or any ICS for that matter in terms of interpreting national requirements and guidelines so that we or we or do we or do we not have the capability to tailor it to our communities such that it will actually have impact the people that we want to impact? And the only other thing quickly I was going to say is, the key thing that I think we need to consider here is that we need to encourage people to take the responsibility themselves for their own health care and, and their own well-being, because there is a big swathe of people in the population that feel, well, the NHS is a safety net. Um, I'll go down to A&E if I need to. And, you know, the um, clinicians will just wave a magic wand and I'll be fine. They don't really understand and realise that life isn't quite like that. So how do we encourage people generally to take more account of their own well-being? Sorry to go on for a bit there. No, not at all, Peter. Thanks. And I'm just wondering, in terms of the smoking services, um, Tom, Rob, do you want to come in with a kind of response in terms of how you're tailoring it locally? And then, and, and if not, I can add some flavour from the from an ICS perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I don't mind picking up from a, from a Derby City perspective, if that's OK. So in terms of, of working with the communities, I, I, I completely agree with with your points and and um, more often than not messages nationally come down and we we then try and translate them to a local level and localize those messages and those ways of working with people. So they are derbified to make sure that they make sense and they are um, suitable for people that we try to support now. If I'm brutally honest, services such as the, the divorce service in the city, and I'm sure this is the case in, in the county there, there are things that have been done that are good in terms of communication. There are things that, are, that are, are le have been less good. And I think a lot of this work that, that Jane has described is a really um, a fantastic opportunity for services such as LiveWell to work better with communities, to not just wait until an individual may be ready, but to look at how we can not just communicate with people to, to understand the cause of the cause, but actually how can we then adapt services as we need to adapt services to create the conditions to be able to prevent those things from happening, prevent that cause of the cause and create the opportunity or the conditions for when the time is right for that individual, that they're aware of what services are available and how those services can be accessed and that they can be accessed in a safe, supportive way, in a way that makes sense to that person. So not in a very, not in a, a, a stick and carrot form, very much around supporting the individual. Thank you, Rob. Pete, did you want to come back to that? Yeah, if I could very quickly. My impression, Rob, uh, and, and absolutely correct me if I'm wrong, uh, and I've got this impression through working with UHDB as a governor, is that we don't have enough flexibility locally to actually make the tailoring changes that we need to make of national messages. 
So no, there is there is a little bit of a diktat from the centre which says, well, I'm sorry, but we need consistency and this is the way that the message needs to be tailored and communicated. Are, are you saying in your response that you feel reasonably comfortable that you do have a, a, enough um, flexibility within your role um, to make the local nuances and changes that you feel you need to make? I would I would like to say that we are in a position to be more open to being flexible. We are being more more flexible as a as a service in in a way that we are engaging with our local populations rather than doing two. So we have to if I use a, a very quick example around weight management, for example. So we we have strict guidelines around supporting people with a BMI of, of 30 plus, et cetera. But in order for those people to access the service, they have to join through a web portal, as an example. And I'm, re I'm trying to really simplify. However, we know that that doesn't suit everybody. So how can we get to people? How can we ensure that there are ways in which people who may find using digital resources more challenging? How can we take the service to those people, understand those people and all of that, all, all that that entails. So that could be communicating in their language. It could be ensuring that, that dietary information is, is relatable to their culture, all of those different things. So we can tailor the messaging and tailor the work to ensure that it supports that individual in the right way. Does that does that answer your question? Are you happy with that response, Pete, or was that wanting a little bit more? Sorry, I was putting thumbs up there. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. uh, it, it, yeah, abs I, I suppose, as I say, I, I've still got a bit of a a bit of a concern that we don't have as much flexibility, that there is a bit of a diktat too much from the sensor. But but yeah, I, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Chloe, is there anything in the chat? Uh, we've got, it's not really a question as such, but it's a good point from... Um, Alan, and it kind of feeds into what Jane's uh, kind of questions were. So they said, I feel like there's a strong link between staying well and starting well. So working with caregivers and young people feels a really important part of making progress in this area. I suppose it gets goes back to kind of the cause of the cause, isn't it? And how far back do you go? And that links in with start well. So um, that no other kind of questions as such. OK, wonderful. OK, Ian, we'd like to bring you in. You're very quiet, Ian. Yeah, so it's not unfamiliar. What aiming to do? I'm not sure quite how you're going to do it. Do it, this really. Ian, I'm struggling to hear you. Would you be able to put your question in the chat so then we can an answer it? Is that all right? Um, no, okay. We'll just move on to John, well, hopefully, and, and then Ian can put his question in the chat and we can respond to that one. John? Yeah, um, <clears throat> my question actually relates um, to the last but one um, person speaking, actually. Uh, when we attended the Start Well session uh, a couple of days ago, um, one of the items that it was raised, uh, like as measures uh, of need, was to what extent young people were school ready. Derbyshire, it seems, is, is down nationally in this. Its score is, is, is not good. But this actually extends, not, it's not just a start well, this extends through into stay well and even the death circumstances that people find themselves in, in terms of have their special needs been met? And it raises the question in my mind is to what extent we're talking about integration here, integration, integration. To what extent are education services integrated into this? I don't see them actually being mentioned in terms of participants or whatever. And we know that these are, exper again, experiencing their own massive resource issues, but there are different almost filter nets here in terms of what goes off in the actual work undertaken with individuals. 
because obviously there's the resource that is, is, is given nationally, there are resources at regional council level and so on. But it comes right down to what goes on in classrooms and in teaching circumstances for school pupils. And yet we see TAs, for example, teaching assistants now being, being cut, being, you know, I, I know one, for example, there. And uh, it was in the papers over the weekend again that uh, th this is a growing issue now because of a, a lack of funding. And this, I, I would say, just is a detrimental, it's a huge impact upon the lives of many people. If you take just one example, autism, you know, the understanding of it, the treatment of it, the way it's dealt with in schools varies enormously. So my question is, <laughs> to what extent is education integrated into this program? Hi there, hi John. So in terms, so if I talk more broadly about the integrated care strategy, so so just bear with me because it, it is trying to answer your question. So the integrated care strategy is a strategy that's been developed in order to test integrated working. So the integrated care strategy is not there to solve all of the um, health and social care problems of Derby and Derbyshire. It's, to, it's there to specifically put a focus on three key areas where as a system we have acknowledged we're not doing enough and and we can test out ways of working as with our communities so the, the point I'd really want to emphasize there is integrated working is not intended to only say how does the NHS work, work with the council or how does one NHS provider work with another NHS provider this is how how do we as communities work together so the point a previous person made around that kind of concord as what can you know, and I'm a, I'm a local resident, so what can I expect from the statutory agencies that I engage with? And actually, what's my responsibility as a local resident as well in order to engage fully um, with those? And, and what do I take on as my own responsibility? So these are three areas to test methods of integrated working, i.e. how do organisations like local authorities, um, voluntary community sector, who are so important in this, communities and the NHS work together for greater good? And the three areas that have been that are ripe for that in for that approach are the school readiness, are um, this stay well, so this focus on those three circulatory diseases that I talked about, and then ageing well, which is around um, services. I'm not going to I don't want to wander into someone else's territory, but it's around services that support people to either not go into hospital in the first place or to be discharged and cared for in their place of that they call home as, as quickly as possible. So those are the three key areas. Now, in terms of the school readiness, that is where education and actually um, children's services providers are really, really closely involved because that ability to ensure a child starts school ready to engage in education will give them the best outcome in life. In terms of within these three circulatory diseases, at the moment, we are focusing on um, that adult population. But I think you make a really powerful point, which is, the, uh, the what is normal and what is seen as healthy lifestyles and healthy behaviours as we progress through early childhood into school and then into adulthood, there is there is messaging that can be consistently given which normalises healthier behaviours. So I think you make a really strong point that we need to go away and think about. So I feel really confident that in the start well element education is is linked in and features within the stay well that's not an area that we've thought about because we've been focusing on that adult population but i think you make a really strong point around education engaged in terms of normalizing healthy behaviors while children go through school so so thanks for thanks for raising that thank you for that thank you john um i don't think we've got anybody else with their hands up at the moment um Yes, Sarah, yes, I can't hear you. Yeah. Um, so, I'm working in primary care. Those who want to engage, obviously, take up the courses and the healthy uh, lifestyle, diet, etc., to reduce their chance of cardiovascular. But it's it, obviously in the, in the more deprived, as you were saying, um, um, from the equalities aspect, um, it's harder to find getting those people to engage in the first place to be aware of. Them 
Thank you. I think I, I got that. Did you get that? Yeah, Jane? I did. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. So I think it's it's Amy, isn't it? Hi, Amy. Um, Hi, yeah. So, so thanks for that. So let me give you a different analogy. So you've absolutely hit on the head, you know, in terms of myself, Rebecca, Tom, Rob, you know, what is the holy grail that we're going after? It is make so we tend to over focus on the people who find their way into our services. And actually, we want to shift that emphasis into who are the people who are not finding their way into our services and who the evidence says would benefit the most so again I'm, I'm at risk of going too um I'm at risk of going too academic but there is a there is um a public health saying which is which is the inverse care law which means those people who are most likely to need our help are least likely to access it and those people who are least likely to need our help are most likely to access it and that's exactly the point you're making there Amy. Yes. So let me give you an example in terms of in terms of local service provision that's going on and it relates to diabetes care. So it is linked to cardiovascular to the circulatory disease. So so everyone who's a newly diagnosed type two diabetic is entitled to an offer of diabetes education to support them in an evidence based programme that um, can aim to either reverse the type two or at least prevent them becoming insulin dependent. And what we looked at was of the people who come through the service, what demographic are they from and who's who actually sticks with the programme? I'm going to use really simple language here. And when we looked at it, we found that of the people who were offered it, 25 percent of people took it up. And of the people who didn't take it up, they were more likely to be from more deprived areas. And when we actually, so then what we did was we we stopped focusing. So we continued to deliver the programmes for the people who had found their way into our services, so the 25. But we actually made a pointed effort, and it was quite an intensive piece of work to go to the 75% of people who who hadn't made their way in, or who attended once and then dropped out. And what we found is that the strongest. Um, feedback we got was it was around what's called health literacy and what health literacy means is the manner in which you are the manner in which you understand the health messages that are being given to you so there's a whole load of complexity in what i've just said it's how is how you spend to verbally so what's the language that someone uses with you and you know i'll put my hand up i've probably used some terms i've probably fallen into using some terms i've tried really hard not to on this call so that you might have thought what is she talking about because when you're ingrained in a healthcare environment, you fall into a, a language that other people maybe don't understand. So it's calling a cell, it's pulling ourselves up on that. So they were they were saying, I didn't understand the severity of diabetes. I'm, again, I'm going to kind of um, be quite generic here. I know a lot of people with diabetes, so it's quite normal. That was another message that came through. And um, in terms of the literature, so in terms of the resources, the leaflets or um, the information that was given out in that first session, I didn't understand it. It used it's it talked about fasting blood glucose. What does that mean? Um, it talked about, you know, it talked about type two diabetes. It talked about insulin. That doesn't mean anything to me. So what we did then was work with our nursing staff and our educators to say actually we need to completely alter a how we invite people so the language we use to emphasize how important it is that people attend diabetes education and that we started to alter how we spoke in the sessions to give the information out and also what are the resources that we used so we really really shifted our what we call our health literacy with in engaging with those with with the diabetes education group and what we are finding now it's really really early days but we are finding that we are getting greater uptake from people from more deprived areas than we were before and we're getting a better what we call adherence rate so people sticking with the program because they don't just turn up for one session so it's really early days but that but that focus on do you know what 25 percent of people have found their way in but we want to focus on the on the 75 percent who haven't what is it that we were doing wrong that meant those people felt they couldn't engage with diabetes education and amy what we want to do with the whole of this stay well is to is to start to use that approach you know rob touched on it in terms when he was when he was talking about the the weight management services is to really start to say what is it that we're doing wrong in how we're offering this service that means people who really need our help are not engaging and you know I, we're not getting it we're, we're getting a lot of things right we're not getting everything right and that's what we want to focus on here so hopefully amy that's kind of answered your question a bit Oh, I'm worried about you. I'm worried about you driving, so I won't wait for a reply. <laughs> <laughs> I thought she'll come back if she if she wants more. Um, uh, I haven't got anybody else with their hands. Was anybody any more comments from the chat box, Chloe? 
no more questions a few comments um that are quite quite good um peter's agreeing that education services need to be a you know real key player in supporting uh, young people to take responsibility for managing their own health um so that goes back to the point about when we talk about education but no specific questions in the chat okay and have you comments. got your hand up for a question Anne, can you hear me all right? I thought Anne had a question up, a hand up, but Anne, can you hear me, Anne? Yes, yes, I can. Thank it's you. Okay, yeah, you want um, to come in? Yeah, yeah, yes, I do. Um, thank you so much for explaining about how the, the use of language affects the health literacy and take up of, of services by uh, people in what are regarded as, as, as deprived areas. I think that is certainly quite important. And it also comes down to messaging. And it's a question of how these messages are received by people, because not everybody's IT, sort of IT literate um, and so on. But the, the point is you are beginning to think about the, the use of language and how the information can be transmitted. So I think that is a is a remarkable um sort of development the, the the thing that i was interested in i know this may be a little premature because this is sort of basically the sort of living well component but you said that what well, we know people are living longer and you're entitled to uh, nhs allows medical checks up to the age of 74 but what happens if you're 74 plus we are supposed to be integrating the system and if we can, we know that there is a follow through and we know what our entitlements are, then people are more likely to use the service. So may I ask what are the provisions between, you know, the, the, in the gap that ensues between the ages of 74, 75 and plus, because you're going to get more people in that category who are going to require your services. Yeah, thanks, Anne. And um, I'm just going to look across. I think Tom might be able to help me out with this one because um, so the N the National NHS Health Checks Programme is is a nationally mandated programme. So, Peter, playing to your point of um, the, the directives that come from from national and they come for good reason, you know, um, so so um, they come because there is an evidence base. There is a growing evidence base around NHS health checks and the effectiveness of them. The 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 age remit that is wrapped around that in terms of national delivery is this is is the forty to seventy four age group and that you're talking about. Now historically, and I'm wandering into territory that is is from my memory. There was a program which was for older persons health checks, um, but my knowledge, Tom, is that that's now stopped. Um, so it was it was trialled. It was found that it didn't fine so in order to conduct a health check there is a cost involved so if you imagine you're offering a health check to 100 people you've got to be sure that you are finding x number of people within that group of whom you can then put an intervention in to prevent them going on to, to, to um, have disease and in having that intervention of 100 people you need to make sure that the cost is is productive in terms of making sure you find it and what was being found was that for that older age group the evidence base wasn't quite as strong what I don't know Tom is whether uh, and I don't know whether you you might be able to know I'm just thinking with with the NHS health checks program whether you're aware as to whether there is I don't think there are any local programs but what we'd have to do Anne is hands up I'd have to come back if Tom's not got the the answer to that yeah I, I just wonder um if if if, if, if for, for the NHS health checks is for people with no long-term conditions so it's the quote unquote healthy population I wonder if actually by 74 people will have at that point um we probably accrued perhaps high blood pressure maybe high blood uh, cholesterol so um there are less people in that population who who are who have no long-term conditions um I, I wonder if that might be that cutoff and I think just discussions around that um um around aging and older people it says not fully the remit of this group but no I based agree. I on, that. yeah but based, based on comments i think earlier is, is is about that tailoring so um actually over 74 is what what services do people need um and i think you know we might be seeing more of a move to actually helping people with you know, loneliness, self social isolation, because that may have a bigger impact on people's lives and perhaps um, uh, that sort of preventative but, health check. 
Yeah, but from, from the perspective of, of creating more integrated care and more importantly, joining up care, I think these are things that sort of, in my opinion, I think these are things that are to be need to be looked at because of an, an increasing aging population but i accept it's slightly outside the remit possibly of this agree of this particular talk but the other thing is may i just sort of ask a polite question listening to what you've been telling me telling us about what the community services offer it seems to me that you're more concerned with research and and um, advice do you actually provide services as well, or, or, or do you act as the facilitator to tell people where to go to get the services? So, oh gosh, right, so I'll try and answer this succinctly, Anne. Um, so, so we all work for different organisations. So if I just explain, so I work for Derbyshire Community Health Services, which is, um, so to describe what, what is that as an NHS provider? So we are the organisation that provides community nursing with your, you know, your, if you go to the physio at a local hospital, it's um, in terms of, you know, when uh, uh, you've got a bad back or you've had a hip problem, it, it's highly likely to be Derbyshire Community Services. We've got podiatry. We do children's services, so health visiting, school nursing. So we provide a load of community services, so healthcare services that are provided in your local community and generally in your home, so community nursing. Um, Tom and um, Rob work for the local authority, so um, Tom's working within public health. Public health provide those um, healthy lifestyle services. Rob's in, in the City Council provides those healthy lifestyle services. But we also, well, and in particular, Tom and Rob, they have an advisory function because public health as well as a provider of services, so um, weight management, smoking cessation services, is also um, provides intelligence to the systems around to the system around what works, what interventions work to um, prevent to, to get people to quit smoking effectively, to ensure that um, um, uh, I don't know children are, are school ready, and so so we 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 kind of straddle both. Um, public health skills tend to straddle tend to straddle provision of services but also trying to give that advice around what the evidence says and I kind of not I'm not probably going to apologize for, for leading on evidence because money is really constricted in the system at the moment so we need to make sure our decisions around what services are provided are informed by the evidence because we don't want to be we don't want to be putting into place things that we know don't work we want to be spending the money on things that are informed by evidence to have a greater likelihood of achieving the outcome we want so hopefully that's explained it um uh, explained it for you and does that help yeah thanks jane for that uh, and just one thing to mention to you as well that um we are doing the same uh, discussions around age well and die well which probably would be more suited to your previous question um so um what chloe can do is put a link in the chat to that and in, in you have a look at that see if you want to sign up and attend that um that'll be really good john i can see you've got your hand up but i'm also aware of the time um, oh, no. very 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 brief just to say on this business of cutoff points our surgery does call folks in because I'm 83 and just, uh, you know, a couple of months ago was called in for a check. It's bloods. On the other hand, um, I, I had Barrett's esophagus diagnosed a number of years ago and was um, called in regularly uh, for checks. But it reached a point where the consultant said, we won't be seeing you anymore and explained it was uh, due to my age. They, they felt then that, it, you know, the whole system really wasn't worth it. I, I just said, well, I assume now you, he, he wrote on my notes, he's ready for the knacker's yard. But um, that was, no, I don't mean that nastily. I think, you know, it was a fair explanation. You know, costly treatment, you know, that you're, you're putting in and uh, people reach an age where you've got to work on statistics of these things to, to a fair degree, haven't you? You know, is it worth going on or not? Thank you. Well, Thanks, there. John. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll feed that in. All good. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, you've put your hand up. Thank you. Um, Jane, I was just picking up from one question in the chat, which I think you might be able to answer, um, was I think related to the health literacy engagement. Peter's asked about whether the learning from this has been read across to other healthcare settings. Oh. Yes. So thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. Yes, it has. So um, as a result of re as a result of the system really beginning to recognise the importance and the absolute fundamental significance of health literacy, um, we have now 
working within to, to um, public health and into the system, we've got a health literacy lead who is influencing across a number of services because health literacy touches on everything from when you call for a vaccination to when you, you, you know, to when you're, you're pregnant with a child. So we're absolutely trying to embed that learning and that individual is brilliant and in very high demand. So, um, yeah. That's brilliant. Thanks, Thanks for that. You know, you know, going back to the health literacy, I'm just wondering if the only one to one work with actually primary care staff to help communicate kind of because obviously as a healthcare professional we understand the evidence base of the comorbidities for some of these um, obviously um, cardiovascular diseases but is there any more kind of one to one kind of online training about the communi communication aspect of that getting across um, and, and that therefore aiding the patient to take some more accountability? There is Amy, and and my closing shot. You've given me you've, you've given me a brilliant opportunity. So we have a program in in the count in joined up care Derbyshire, which is called Quality Conversations, and it is training on health coaching for staff, so that when they embark on conversations with patients, it's in an empowerment approach. So we stop being parental, um, and we work to really support people to explain what is it that matters to me and what is it that I want out of this intervention so we stop as clinicians we stop operating in what we would call that parental we will do to you field so Amy I've, I've spotted your name on the chat what I'll do is um is I'll, if, if you don't mind I'm going to look you up on the NHS net and then I'll drop you a separate line to, to um, help help you work that one through if you'd like it for your practice. That's wonderful. I'd like to bring the, the meeting to a close now just to let everybody know we'll be sending out an email following this with a link to the tile. This will be uploaded. There's other opportunities to feedback and you can also see the development of this particular key area focus as well. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jane and all the other presenters for coming today. Thank you, everybody, for all your questions uh, and have a lovely evening. Thank you, everyone.